So we will be having um, a series of these webinars just to sensitize the members on the provisions of the Act 2022 uh, through the month of August and into September. Uh, I'm sure anybody who has taken a look at the Act already can appreciate that it's not something that we can cover extensively in just one webinar. And so we will try to have as many webinars as possible to bring all our members up to speed. We are very delighted that we have 100 participants this afternoon, which is quite exciting. Um, and it definitely is a, a motivating factor for us to keep this going. Now, this afternoon we have um, a presenter who is actually well known in this particular space, the uh, Children Matters. And we are privileged and honored to have Dr. Elvis Abenga, who will be speaking to us about the changes in the act, what we need to look out for, whether we are practitioners or simply because we need to understand this act because it affects our children. Um, and so with that, I welcome you to the webinar. I'm sure that the discussion will be interesting and exciting enough to keep us very warm this afternoon. It's quite cold. Um, and for those who are asking for a recording, yes, this will be on Facebook on our page. You'll be able to get it later. So ladies and gentlemen, um, enjoy the discussion. I hope that uh, you'll be able to gather something useful from this. And I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Back to you, Clement, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I know, uh, Take this opportunity to introduce to our members our speaker for today, Dr. Elvis Abenga, who is a, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and one of the founding partners of Peggy's Law Offices and Chambers. He is a holder of a Doctor of Philosophy in Commercial Law, a Master of Laws, uh, specializing in dispute resolution from the University of Cape Town, a postgraduate diploma in law from Kenya School of Law, as well as a Bachelor of Laws, honors from Moi University. He is the managing partner for Begis Law Offices and Chambers, a premier full practice law firm. And as a practitioner, uh, Daktari has specialized in family law, uh, children law, and human rights litigation. As a litigator, uh, Daktari has been privileged to perfect the art of courtroom litigation through engaging in client representation uh, at various courts of law in the land, including the Court of Appeal. Daktari is also privileged to have been trained as a trial lawyer by the National Institute for Trial Advocacy, uh, an American Trial Advocacy Training Institute. Daktari is also a member of the Law Society of Kenya, the International Court of Justice, and is a litigator and children's rights uh, protector uh, with Cradle Foundation. His legal uh, passion for justice has won him several awards, including the Pro Bono Lawyer of the Year Award by Cradle. Uh, welcome, Dr. Chari, and please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Clement, thank you, uh, my senior, uh, Ellen, and Missy, the chair. It's it's really a, a very big and humbling opportunity for me to talk about the Children's Act 2022 because it's something uh, that's very exciting. As soon as uh, the president signed it into law, and in fact, even before this, the president signed it, the, the bill into law and it had been recommended uh, by the cabinet and all that, uh, the provisions are already very exciting. And now just seeing it come, come to life and overhauling uh, the entire practice of children law in Kenya, uh, it's, it's a very exciting uh, piece of legislation. And I would dare say that uh, the greatest winners are the children of Kenya. Because for the first time, I think we have uh, one of the best children legislations, uh, not just in Africa, but in the entire world, I would say, I would dare say that, yeah, because of the nature of protection that 
children are being accorded to, and we shall look at some of the changes which are very massive, but very interesting at the same time uh, that the Children's Act has provided. So, um, because just like uh, Madam Chair had said, this is a very extensive conversation. I had prepared around 70 slides, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll not, I don't think I'll be able to cover all of that, but we will be able to cover, to, you know, to have, to, to see as far as we can go within a space of about 40 minutes to an hour, then we can have a, an interactive uh, question and answer session as we move on. The idea behind it is, uh, you know, let's just get abreast. And my, my intention is not to teach law really, but to just uh, get all of us to have a bit of interest in reading this new legislation and understanding it, you know, as ourselves, as, as lawyers. Uh, Clement, please enable me to share my screen so that I could, uh, I could put on my slides. As uh, the secretariat do, um, does that, maybe just by show of hands, how many have had an opportunity to read the act? You can just use that, there's a reaction place down there on Zoom that allows you to raise your hand. If you've had an, our chance to even just have a glance at the new act, just by show of hands so that we can see, you know, how we are. Yeah. That's great. Quite a number of us have. I'm sure we, sh we, we will be able to engage more on this. Let me try sharing my screen. Thank you. Nini? Aki. Um, also, kind uh, request if you can mute yourself if you're not asking a question or something so that. You can you can be able to to be unhindered. All right. Uh, so I'll just get right into it. Uh, as we know, uh, we're just talking about the Children's Act 2022. Just a rough overview uh, of what it's about, the important provisions that we need to know. Uh, just as a precursor to this, I'd I'd like to say that the Act was enacted in compliance with the Kenyan re the requirements under the conventions on the right of the child. When you look at article two of this convention, it mandates uh, uh, state parties to the convention to uh, progressively enact legislation and set up standards for the enforcement and recognition of the rights of a child. So uh, the <clears throat> stakeholders realized that the previous 2001 act uh, left a lot uh, that was not covered and a lot of uh, provisions, you know, would then be subject to uh, judicial interpretation, both by the children's court and the high court. There were a lot of uh, vague uh, provisions. Uh, for instance, we look at, pro uh, you know, as we, as we move on, uh, some definitions such as the definition of an age, definition of uh, stuff like that, that would, would be very vague. And the Children's Act 2022 has tried to cover the bases as much as possible when it comes to uh, definitions, as well as when it comes to recognition of the types of abuse. It has revamped prov provisions on uh, child support, child custody, adoptions, and guardianships, uh, which I shall try to look at uh, for now. As well as you know, uh, the basis for practicing children law is Article 53, uh, which provides for the right of a child and the right of a child to name and nationality, 
free and compulsory basic education, basic nutrition, shelter, health care, protection from abuse, neglect, violence, parental care and protection, and not to be detained except as a last resort. So we'll notice with time uh, that the old act provided for major parts of uh, these rights, except uh, for the sixth right uh, about not being detained except as a last resort. There was a general pro pro, you know, legal provision that would allow for diversion, but now we have uh, diversion being properly recognized under the Children's Act and uh, procedures and circumstances for diversion being set. So the constitution remains you know, to be the anchor that we are working on and specifically article 53. So I'll just uh, go towards you know, definitions, the important definitions that we uh, are looking at. The ones, there are so many others in the new act but I just selected the ones which are new and different from what was in the previous uh, act, if I would use that word. So as I said, section two uh, of the Children's Act, a very long section that now provides for, for the new definitions. First of all, we have adoption. For the first time, we have the definition of an adoption being uh, the process through which a child is permanently placed with a legal parent or parents in accordance to part 14 of the act. This definition uh, wasn't there previously in the, in the old act. In fact, the old act, the repealed act, if I would use that word, did not mention the definition of adoption. It just went straight into adoption practices and procedures. But first here now we're getting a definition of adoption as a permanent process for placing legal parents, for placing a child with legal parents. But as you shall see, uh, the nature of permanency is subject to debate because sometimes we can have adoption orders reviewed uh, through uh, different applications that can be done for that. So it's still questionable as to whether the word permanent would be accurate in describing that process. But nonetheless, we have it there. It's, it's part of the act, a new definition of that. Then for the first time, we have uh, a definition of age of a child. When you look at the old Children's Act, the word age was defined as the defined or actual age or a certain age. So it wasn't really defining anything. It was just saying very in very vague terms as such. But now we are being told that age means the actual chronological age of the child from conception or the child, <clears throat> sorry, the child's apparent age as determined by a medical officer in any case where the actual age of the child is unascertainable. So age is now being calculated from conception, not from birth. I have no idea how the registrar of birth will do this, or maybe they will do some estimation through the medical officer. I don't know how that would work because previously it would be easy, just the date of birth is recorded and the child's age is calculated from there. But here we're being told that the age is chronological from conception, not from birth. So I guess we, this, these are some of the provisions we need to test and see how they would work. But on, on hindsight, you'd say that it's trying to align uh, the provisions of the Children's Act with Article 26 of the Constitution, you know, providing for the right that, you know, children, life begins at conception. That's what the Constitution says. So 
the constitution doesn't say life begins at birth, it says life begins at conception, and now the act is defining age from conception as well. Uh, the practicalities of that are yet to be seen, uh, very interesting times coming up ahead. In addition to that, um, for the first time, we have the definition of what amounts to the best interest of the child. For those of us who practice children and law, we'd see every time we talk up, we do any application in court, we say that this is the best interest of the child. We go to uh, right submissions, we're talking about best interest of the child, but the 2001 repealed act did not define what exactly best interest of the child was, but only set uh, uh, a criteria or a guideline for we, the court to use in determining what the best interest is. But uh, now the drafters and framers of this act, the current act borrowed from the definition found in the Child Rights Convention, the African Convention as well, and um, international law in defining best interest of the child to mean principles that prime the child's right to survival, protection, participation, and development above other considerations, and includes the rights contemplated under Article 53 of the Constitution and Section 8 which we've already looked at. I've just touched uh, on Article 53 briefly on, on those rights we looked at. So those, uh, the child's right to survival, the child's right to protection, the child's right to, to develop, and those rights to basic education, parental care and protection, all those are combined from what now the act is saying, the principles that underline the best interest of the child. Then for the first time, the act has gone into a great detail of what child abuse is. Child abuse being defined as the infliction of physical harm by any person in a child. Now, previously, under the old act, the repealed act, I would use that, we did not have a definition of child abuse, but on a very rudimentary and general knowledge, we knew that child abuse just, is just about you know, physically harming a child. And we would borrow provisions from the Protection Against Domestic Violence Act in defining what child abuse is and in, you know, incorporating that into uh, protection for children. But now we don't need to go to the PADVA as much as it is still applicable. The Children's Act itself expands the definition of what child abuse is by stating not just the physical harm, but it's talking about infliction or inducement of physical harm by any person on a child by acts intended to cause harm or negligent acts or omissions that actually cause harm. And then a very interesting provision here, see the failure by any person to protect a child from physical harm or to report a case of child abuse. So now we have under the act, a mandatory reporting obligation. You see a child being abused, uh, you have a right and a duty, a positive obligation to report that kind of abuse. If you do not do that, you are as guilty as the abuser, as the primary abuser, if I would use that word. So that obligation uh, uh, to report, then we have acts or omissions that affect a child's healthy social and emotional development and functioning, including rejection, isolation, deprivation of affection and cognitive stimulation, inappropriate criticism or comparison with other children. Some things which I think some parents do, which are very, they think are innocent, yeah? Where you, uh, I'll give an example I gave in a presentation I had last week on this a similar topic. Your child comes home and uh, uh, has not performed very well maybe your child was number 15 out of 30. 
and then you tell this child, um, why are you not like uh, so and so uh, who got number one? Are you more stupid than them? Are you not going through the same school? You know, that kind of comparison that kind of demeans a child that is now being defined and, you know, to, it's covered in the scope of what abuse is. Humiliation, malicious accusation, you know, uh, all these things that are targeting to uh, emotionally isolate a child or hurt a child. That is abuse. So you can, you know, read a little bit more on, on it and uh, the extent to which abuse is so that we can, as lawyers, we can be able to identify abuse and fight child abuse even in in our communities, in our places of residence, and all so on and so forth. Another win for the ch ch children of Kenya is that now a child who is in conflict with the law um, has been defined as a person above 12 years of age, but below the age of 18 years, who has been dealt with or punished in accordance with you know, part 15, of the act or any other written law for contravention of the law. So in a nutshell, what we are saying, uh, the age of criminal liability has now been increased from eight years to 12 years, which is a very good thing because uh, uh, we've, we've been um, instantly, I mean, we've been, We've had in instances where you have a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old who has been accused of stealing or doing things like that. And you they're taken to court and you, you're just seeing a small child. And uh, for those of us who are parents, you can actually see your child in that child. And you feel like maybe there would be something different the system could be done, could do for this child so that they are not uh, part of um, this. They, they don't get through the criminal justice system. But now uh, we at least have 12 years and above, which is a win. Corporal punishment has also now been defined. Previously, we did not have a definition of corporal punishment under the old act, the repealed act. Um, now we do. It means the use of physical force applied on a child by the use of any means, including a cane or other object with the intention of inflicting pain or discomfort for the purpose of corrective discipline or punishment. So corporal punishment is defined and outlawed under the act. So it doesn't matter that, you know, a parent is arrested and said, you know, I just, you know, pinched my child a little bit. Or, you know, the, we've had cases where a parent is arrested and says, you know, but my child was not really injured. You know, it was just a simple slap, that is still illegal. Still, you know, now we have a basis for defining what corporal punishment really is. Then we have, uh, again, for the first time, official legal recognition for diversion, uh, where we're talking about diversion means the intervention and programs designed to divert children from the criminal justice system with the aim of one, reducing stigmatization of children who are in conflict with the law, and two, identifying children at risk and connecting them with appropriate support services. Again, as I said, and I really encourage all advocates in this platform, if you're, you're able to and you want to give back to the society, take some time and go and register as a, a pro bono, service provider for the children's court. We've had week on, on weekly we have children in Milimani and even in Makadara who are get who get arrested and they're processed. 
and most of the times uh, we are there asking for advocates to come and you know take up some of this representation uh, in the best interest of these children so before i forget uh, if you're listening to me even online uh, through the streaming process please uh, we need your services as advocates so that we can uh, be able to help our children who are in conflict with the law but nonetheless on diversion we are talking about all these programs that will try to divert children from the criminal justice system a diversion is was a program a concept that originated from europe and the us uh, that have very robust diversion pro programs that try to really really uh, get it to the last extent as if they come to play if she's still eating if a child has to go through the court process and get uh, incarcerated it would be as a very very last resort after everything else has been tried and failed that's the whole idea behind diversion and then uh, we also have the, the idea behind it is to provide programs and support to children who have engaged in offending conduct preventing them from progressing further into the system as well as reducing recidivism by children in conflict with the law. Recidivism is where a child has uh, committed a crime or offended, as we would call them, offended the law, and then gets into the system, gets out and repeats the same offense or does a separate offense. That is what recidivism. So uh, diversion would be a conversation I think we'll have at another time because it's an entire discussion uh, just on the psychological basis behind diversionary programs but for purposes of today at least we just know that diversion is officially recognized under the act and the guidelines on how that works then uh, we have recognition of the rights of intersex children again um, for the first time and I, just like I mentioned in another presentation, I give credit to Senior Counsel Chigiti and his team that have been at the forefront in fighting for the recognition of the rights of the intersex child. And finally, we, the intersex child is now under the, you know, under, is now recognized under the Act. Intersex means a child with a congenital connection condition in which the biological sex characteristics cannot be exclusively categorized in the common terms of either male or female. So this is a, a lot of legal definition there, but in short, for an intersex child, you're not able to tell whether the child is male or the child is female uh, based on that binary classification. Some have both genitalia, some have absence of both genitalia, and you know all that condition, that is an intersex child. And um, now for we, you know, there was the court order, the court uh, order that directed the government to recognize in, uh, intersex children in terms of uh, the registration so that you know you can have not just male female but also a provision for intersex during uh, the registration of birth process we also have for those professing the islamic faith we have kafala uh, uh, where a person uh, a child who professes an islamic faith uh, is placed in the care and protection of another person who also professes the same Islamic faith uh, in instances which are provided for under the act, which we shall look at uh, very briefly. Uh, for the first time, Kafala is recognized and now covers uh, uh, the Islamic faith. It was not there pre previously under the old act. And so there were instances where we'd have cases where the you know the children's act is is almost inconsistent with the beliefs of the islamic faith uh, you know and 
through the Sharia and all that. But now we have kafala, and that can be you know sort 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 that out. Then, uh, we are still on you know, the new definitions under the Act. The defi we have the parent being defined to mean the mother or father or any person who has been conferred parental rights by the law. Previously, uh, parent was very vaguely defined under the old act to mean a biological parent or someone who has acquired parental responsibility. And now we think it's simply the mother or father or any person who is conferred parental rights by the law. Then for the first time we have definition of vulnerable child. A vulnerable child means a child whose safety, well-being or development is threatened, infringed or violated. And it includes a child who is emotionally deprived or traumatized. So you can see again, the, the protection of these children is being taken very seriously by defining what vulnerable child children or a vulnerable child is. Before I get into the paramountcy clause under section eight of the new act, um, there is one definition that was in the previous children's act that is not in the current act. And that was the definition of a child of tender years. In the old act, a child of tender years was defined as a child who is under the age of 10. That definition has subsequently been avoided or omitted in this new act. The importance of that omission is, uh, in my own opinion, uh, that now men and women have equal rights to custody of children, regardless of the age, of course, taking into account the best interest of the child as a paramount uh, consideration. And we'll look at how the act actually, you know, equals the playing field in that sense. There were cases where uh, men would feel like the act is discriminatory, the old act by the virtue of the fact that it would the definition of tender years would, was used now to develop law uh, through judicial interpretation uh, by the High Court to make it uh, almost automatic that a child of tender years would be with the mother, unless there are exceptional circumstances that would not allow for that. But now that that isn't there, we, if we, we wait to see how the courts will decide and hopefully, again, the buffer clause here is that of you know what we call the paramount, uh, the paramountcy clause under section eight. This was also in the previous act. It says all judicial and administrative institutions and all persons acting in the name of such institutions, when exercising any powers conferred under the act shall treat the interests of the child as the first and paramount consideration to the extent that this is consistent with adopting a course of action calculated to. So in short, best interest of the child is the paramount consideration and we saw what that is. And this comes in when it comes to safeguarding and promoting the rights and welfare of the child, two, conserving and promoting the welfare of, of the child, three, securing the child for the child guidance and correction as is necessary for the welfare of the child and in the public interest. So that's the main goal of, you know, uh, and application of the paramountcy clause. Also, uh, we now have the, ch the child under section 12, has a right to social security, a right that was not previously uh, crystallized as such. Yeah? And this is uh, where we're seeing a, a child whose parent is not able to provide for the child. 
and it includes um, what we call provision for alternative care services. And these alternative care services are like kinship care, guardianship, foster care, adoption, uh, kafala, care in emergency situations, temporary shelters, supported independent living, supported child-headed households and aftercare. So I'll talk about some of these very exciting provisions. Under the act as it is right now, a child would be supported to live independent in the event where, as we see, the child does not have any parent who is able, uh, and by extension, any guardian who is able to provide for the child. Also, we have now what we're calling child are headed by children. Uh, there was a time when, uh, sorry, I'm having some small technical interruptions, but should be okay. Uh, we have children, uh, I've interacted with children who, are, who need care and protection, especially children whom, who have run away from home. We often call them uh, chokoras in street language, and I have a big problem with that term as well, but just for purposes of understanding. You know, you get these kids who are out there in the streets, and you realize that a lot of them um, ran away from abuse at home, and now they are, they get together, they band together, and come and have what we call child-headed households, where they're actually living together. And you have, you know, it's it's a mixture of both independent living and child-headed households. Now we have that as well as aftercare being recognized under the Act. So I'm going to talk about parental responsibility. I'm rushing against time, but uh, I hope, as I said, this will give you impetus to read the act deeper by yourself. So of course, section 31 defines what parental responsibility. It means all the duties, rights, powers, responsibilities, and authority, which by law a parent of a child has in relation to a child. Now, uh, you notice that parental responsibility can only be defined, be exercised by a parent. Because it's saying uh, all the duties, rights, powers, responsibilities, and authorities which by law a parent of a child has. So again, go back into the definition uh, of a parent as we started on in the in the in the in the Children's Act uh, definitional point. We had uh, cases. Uh, maybe I'm sure we've all encountered them. Uh, and there's actually one litigation that that's still ongoing in court where. A a parent or someone goes and uh, there's, contest, there's a contest as to whether or on paternity issues. And uh, someone who is not biologically related to the child uh, takes the child, lives with the child, provides for the child, then later on comes and, uh, and says that they have you know, gotten what we call acquired parental responsibility. Uh, which you know then uh, creates a, a dilemma when the actual parent comes along to to want to also exercise the same rights and responsibilities. But now under section thirty one, uh, parental responsibility is which is authority which by law a parent of a child. So you have to ask yourself who is a parent in accordance with the definition. Then we have uh, an expanded list of the needs of a child. We, under the 2001 Repealed Act, we had five major needs, nutrition, shelter, water, clothing, and medical care. And then we had the, the, this need number six, that is called general guidance, social conduct, and moral values, was not classified as a need, but as a right of a parent. So uh, the, the parent would have a right to give guidance uh, on social conduct and moral values to the child. 
but now it is now being classified as one of the needs of, a, of the children. So I'm anticipating that when we will be drafting plans in the children's court, we will be now including this, uh, the court would need to make provision for, who, for how the child will be guided. I once had a client who uh, did not really want uh, the other parent to provide monetarily or uh, financially, but wanted the other parent to be part of the child's life in terms of provision of uh, uh, religious and moral guidance. You know, if it's a if it's a boy child and the boy needs to get circumcised and groomed into adulthood that kind of provision. And it was a very unique case, uh, but now I'm excited because now it is being recognized as an actual need that should be provided for. Then of course, as I said, uh, equal parental rights and responsibilities now provided for under section 32, close one of the act. Subject to the provisions of the act, the parents of a child shall have parental responsibility over the child on an equal basis and neither the father nor the mother of the child shall have a superior right or claim against the other in exercise of such parental responsibility, whether or not the child is born within or outside wedlock. You may remember that we had section 24 of the previous act which was defined, uh, was later on uh, ruled out to be unconstitutional by the court. And now this has now been provided for under the new act equality, as well as you know, anchoring and mirroring the provisions of article 53 of the constitution on equal parental responsibility for the mother and the child. Now I'll hasten here to say that provision of the child is a right of the child. It is not a right of the parent. That is what the constitution says. It says the right that every child has a right to, then a clause six, equal parental responsibility. So it is actually a, a right of the child, and it's a child who can enforce that right, of course, through the parent, but it is not a parental right. Then uh, we have parental responsibility agreement uh, previously provided under section 25 of the uh, Children's Act 2001 repealed, but now the new act has, en has enlarged the scope of what a parental responsibility agreement is and included a provision it says parents of a child who are not married to each other may enter into a <clears throat> PRA in the prescribed form. Previously, even uh, parents who were married to each other could still enter into parental responsibility agreements. But now for reasons uh, which we will find out with time, uh, only parents who are not married to each other can enter into parental responsibility agreements. I, want, I don't know what the mischief is that the legislature tried to cure, but that's the law as it is right now. And now we have this, what we call a parenting plan, which uh, now talks about every parental, whenever you are drafting a parental responsibility agreement for your clients, you need to also incorporate a parenting plan for the agreement to be valid. And this is the scope of what a parenting plan would be. That is a child, you have the time, how the child shall spend time with each parent, joint decision-making procedure, contact information, visitation schedule, holiday schedule, transport and travel out of Kenya, need for notification of parental movement where residents change. If you have parents who are co-parenting and one leaves and moves to another location, there is now a requirement for for notification of the other parent of that kind of change. And now we have, in addition to the parenting plan, the PRA can be revoked. 
uh, or terminated only through an order of the court made by application by either one, a person who has parental responsibility or two by the child themselves. And for the first time, again, guys, I'm sorry, I'm moving very quickly. Uh, the parental responsibility, breach of parental responsibility agreement creates a liability for imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to a fine not exceeding 500,000 shillings or even both. So previously we'd have clients and clients would ask me question. So why, why, why should we get into a PRA if uh, when there's violation, the, whole, the entire process of, of, of child support and child custody starts afresh at the children's court? And uh, in the previous act, because we did not have such uh, of an offense created, the only option we'd have is to use contempt of court proceedings by taking out a notice to show cause and such for violation of parental responsibility agreement where the agreement had been adopted as an order of the court. So right now, uh, within current provision, I think uh, we should be able to have more uh, compliance uh, on people taking parental. You, you tell your clients when, you, when, when, when they're in your office and they're signing that agreement, uh, or if you, for those of us who act as mediators, that once they sign that agreement and it's a parental agreement, if there's any violation, they, sh they are now liable to be arrested for that kind of violation. So very quickly, custody and maintenance. Um, this has also been ramped up. Initially, uh, section 73 of the old act uh, provided for principles in making the custody order. But now in general, these are now under section 103. They've been enlarged to say the conduct you know, the court has to take into account the conduct of a parent or guardian of the child, the wishes of relatives of the child, the wishes of the child themselves, whether there is harm, the customs of the community, religious persuasions, whether there's a care order, circumstances of siblings of the child and the best interest of the child. All these uh, are determined. Then uh, when it these are determinations when it comes to making a custody order under section 103. And now when making maintenance orders, we now pro have provisions under section 114. Uh, the court has to take into account the income and earning capacity of the parties. This is to still happen. The court would ask for affidavits of means to confirm how the parties are, are faring on uh, financially. The financial needs and obligations uh, each party has the needs of the child, income from any property of the child, any medical condition of the child, and how the child was expected to be trained and educated. Whether the respondent has previously assumed parental responsibility. So all these are, you know, considerations that you advise your clients on. Uh, when it comes to the making of maintenance orders. So again, very quickly, I'm going to talk about guardianship. A guardian, uh, just like uh, the previous section one or two of the old act uh, that provided for what guardianship is, uh, the current act now under section 122 emphasizes that it's a person who exercises parental responsibility of a child on the death of the parent of the child, either alone or jointly with the surviving parent of the child. So one new provision that wasn't there uh, in the old act is that now under the current act, a guardian must be a Kenyan citizen. So you cannot make a guardianship application for foreigners. I believe the court, uh, I mean, the drafters figured out that uh, foreigners would apply for guardianship when, uh, especially when there was the moratorium against international adoptions. 
uh, there would be an attempt to circumvent that by running through guardianship and taking the child out of the jurisdiction of the country, out of Kenya, by guardians uh, who are foreigners. And now to cure that mischief, section 122 is now saying, um, you know what? Kenyans and only Kenyans can be guardians, nothing more than that. Again, we must protect our children from child trafficking uh, and we must do everything. And now even uh, further protection for a child under section 122.4 says that a guardian who is not the father or mother of the child shall not remove the child from the jurisdiction of Kenya without obtaining an order of the court. And such leave shall be granted only in exceptional circumstances. So again, even if you're a Kenyan and you're not the parent, you can't take the child out even if you're the, you have a guardianship order. Again, we are fighting child trafficking by all means. And as I said, this act is helping protect the Kenyan children, the Kenyan child as much. It offers better protection than the previous act. These are provisions that were not there previously. Then we have an enli uh, enlarged uh, role of what we call a testamentary guardian. The previous act only provided for testamentary guardians to be uh, guardians who are appointed by either deed or will. But now we have under section 122, subsection nine, a testamentary guardian, their role is to administer the estate of a child create a trust fund for the child, safeguard the estate of the child from damage, prepare an inventory of accounts which they need to be making every year and reporting on that. And also, you know, producing account and inventory in court when the same is required. Then uh, the surviving parent has a right to act jointly together with the guardian who has been appointed whether it's by the father or by the mother. So if the father uh, is uh, has appointed a guardian and then he passes on, then that guardian would act jointly with the mother and vice versa, for, you know. That's what section 123 says, both clause one and clause two, joint action. And now we have um, appointment of guardians by deed. Uh, that, that was also in the old act. But um, a new provision here is that a guardian who has been appointed can also further be appointed, can further appoint another person to act as a guardian when that guardian's death has been, has, when that guardian has died. So if I'm a guardian, I've been appointed by my brother to act as a guardian for his child. And I feel like I, we need a, a more provision, more protection. I can further on appoint another person to also be a guardian in my place in the event that I die. So that's appointment by deed. And now section 124 provides for the requirements, uh, new requirements, uh, that is the deed must be dated and signed in the presence of two witnesses, similar provisions such as, you know, that for, for, for wills, you know, uh, how, how wills would work. Then for appointment by will, the will must be valid under the Law of Succession Act. So, and as, as you guys know already, a deed under the customary deed, how it would be, it would have to be to, to have a seal and all that for it to be a valid deed. So when you're preparing a deed uh, of guardianship for your clients, make sure you comply with the new provisions. A parent can object to the appointment of a guardian by the other parent, that is under section 124. Uh, you can go read uh, and if the other, or even a guardian themselves can, can have an objection to, to appointment, to their own appointment, or if they feel that the, the parent of the child is unfit to take care of the child, they can object to exercising joint guardianship. 
And when they make that objection, the court would then have to make a determination, uh, either decline making an order confirming testamentary appointment of guardian. So this under this is under section 124. And um, the fact that the court says the power and court is saying that it can make an order confirming, declining to confirm testamentary appointment of guardian gives me the impression that appointments of guardians by deed, by testamentary guardians must be sanctioned by the court. So that's something that again, we'll see what the, what the practice and what the courts will determine on that. If we make an order that guardian sh the guardian shall act jointly with the surviving parent or make an order that a relative of the child shall act jointly with the guardian and parent to the child, or even make an order that the guardian shall be the sole guardian to the child. These are some of the orders that the court has power with. Then the court itself can, uh, apart from where a parent has appointed a guardian under section 125, the court can appoint a guardian where the child's parents are deceased, cannot be found, and the child has no guardian or other person having parental responsibility. So in such situation, the court is empowered to make a guardianship order. And especially, and also where we have a child who needs uh, enforcement of maintenance orders that had been previously provided for. So our guardianship can be revoked. That means any person who makes a special, an appointment of a guardian, if by a parent, or even by a guardian who appoints a subsequent guardian can be revoked uh, through either a specific instrument, which the law does not specify, but it applies in the same way as uh, the similar provisions to revocation of wills under the Law of Succession Act, either through codicils and such and such. So what's the procedure for revocation of a guardianship? So the person who makes the, re the, the revocation uh, must do it in writing. It's, it, it's made by the person who made the, appointed, the appointment and in the presence of two witnesses who attest, who both attest that, you know, to the signature and direction of the person who made the appointment. Remember the, the same procedure we use, we talked about for the requirements of a deed uh, being witnessed by two witnesses. Now a revocation is also being witnessed by two witnesses as such, as well as uh, termination of guardianship. Uh, a guardianship mm -hmm. can be terminated by an order of the court, uh, by a parent or guardian, or even the child can uh, ask for the guardianship to be terminated. A relative can ask or any other person who wants to act in the best interest of the child. And of course, they'll have to explain what, uh, you know, the guardian, what, what the termination is done. Now in just five minutes, I'm going to brush through very quickly the adoption procedures, very briefly under the act. And hopefully we'll get time to get into more details on this. We have three, uh, and I would dare say almost, I think four adopt types of adoptions. But a section 183 uh, now recognizes one kinship adoption, which is an adoption by a relative. Uh, the previous act, uh, Children's Act did not provide for kinship adoption, but through practice and procedure, we were able to do a lot of kinship adoptions, but now it's recognized. Two, a local adoption, and a local adoption is where a child is resident in Kenya, and parents are Kenyan nationals resident in Kenya. And then we have a foreign adoption. But then we have a fourth category of adoption, which is not listed here, but is listed in another provision of the law we look at briefly, which is called inter-country adoptions. But I'll talk about it briefly. Uh, uh, the scope of foreign adoptions under section 183. For that, of course, uh, kinship adoptions are straightforward and local adoptions are straightforward, but the new provisions that we are having are now for the foreign adoption. And a foreign adoption happens where 
adopting parents are Kenyans with dual citizenship, adopting parents are, are or adopting parents are foreign nationals. Adopting parents uh, are foreign nationals, but biologically related to the child. So also like kinship adoption or adopting parents who are once Kenyan nationals, but lost citizenship by operation of law of the host country. So these are, this, this is where, you know, the scope of foreign adoptions. Prerequisites for adoption, one for the child specifically under section 184, the child must have been declared free for adoption and must have attained six weeks. Again, uh, we now have uh, an enhanced provision uh, against pre-selection under section 184 that provides an applicant shall not pre-select a prospective adoptive child except A, where there's a kinship adoption or two, where the applicant is a foster parent. Pre-selection simply means you don't choose the child you're going to adopt. You go through the process, you're matched, your bonding, the mandatory bonding process works under the adoption rules, which we shall look at in another presentation. Uh, and uh, then the process is done and that. Who are children who are eligible for adoption? A child who is an orphan and has no guardian to take care of the child. A child who has been abandoned and cannot be traced, uh, and parents can't be traced for one year or children who have been willingly offered up for adoption by biological parents. Under the act, now a, a parent can just willfully offer the child for, up for adoption. That wasn't there previously under the old act. So for the applicants, the applicants must be between 25 years old and 65, not younger than 25, not more than 65. Uh, for the applicant or where the both applicants must be more than 21 years older than the child. That was also there. So we have some prohibitions on from adoption. Uh, this category of people are prohibited from adopting one, a sole male applicant, unless the applicant is a blood relative of the child. I know uh, guys are going to be up in arms because of this because it, it's almost discriminatory, uh, but a sole male applicant cannot uh, adopt unless they're adopting a relative, a person of unsound mind, a person exercising, in, a person who's incapable of exercising guardianship and care for the child, and a person who's been convicted for some offenses uh, which uh, have, have been stipulated. These are serious felonies which are uh, or offenses against the child. Uh, you can read the third schedule of the Children's Act on that. Then also, if where there's joint ap applications, the joint applicants, if they're not married to each other, they cannot uh, uh, be, they can't be given an adoption. And where we have a single foreign applicant, where the applicant is not a biological relative of the child. Then of course the provision says under section 186, again, in every matter, the overriding interest is the best interest of the child. So the court still has discretion in making that any adoption order to decline, to grant the order, and by extension also to approve orders in favor of persons when it is in the best interest of children to, to do that. So the a few consents uh, that are required, the consent of the parent or guardian, uh, the consent of the spouse, the consent of a child. If the child is over 10 years old, the child will need to consent as well. But uh, where consent has been, the court can dispense with consent under section 187, where you have a parent or guardian who had previously abandoned, neglected, or failed to take care of the child or mistreated the child, or where the person who is required to give consent cannot be found or is incapable or has unreasonably withheld consent. Then the court then under section 188 makes uh, on its own motion uh, or an application of any party to the proceedings, it makes an order for appointment of a guardian ad litem 
who has uh, the following roles. One, you know, safeguarding the interests of the child during adoption proceedings, investigating and reporting to court facts, re making recommendations or to the court whether an adoption order should be made or not, and also intervening in the event of withdrawal of any consent. And lastly, in the uh, context of this, application, a biological parent can come back and say under section 190 that the, he wants the adoption order reviewed or set aside uh, where, you know, because you know, an adoption order terminates any parental rights or responsibility of biological parent. So the parent can come and say, uh, I, this child was lost or abducted and I took all the measures I could to find the child. And, you know, it is in the best interest of the child to reunite with the biological parent so they can make the necessary application and the court would consider either varying the adoption order so as to allow for the, for the biological parent to also have some level of custody of the child or making any other uh, orders in the best interest of the children or the child. Lastly, as I said, we have a fourth, uh, what we call inter-country adoptions. Well, maybe they, it's also almost like uh, a foreign adoption. Uh, so the court under section 191, the court may make an adoption order in respect of a child on the joint application of two spouses who are not citizens or residents of Kenya. And this is called, you know, inter-country adoptions. And these are the qualifications. First and foremost, all efforts to trace the child's parents and relatives have failed despite all the state support. And uh, to all other arrangements for placement of the child in a family-based alternative care have been exhausted and failed in such situations. Then necessary consents have been obtained then uh, for foreign or inter-country adoptions, the foreigners must satisfy the court that the country they intend to live in after the adoption will recognize the adoption. So uh, just recently I was advising some clients to go and do the whole social inquiry and get a court from their country to issue orders saying that should they adopt in Kenya that that adoption would be recognized in that country. All these are just for purposes of uh, safeguarding the interests of our children. And also, you know, they should have been recommended by persons who are fit and financially capable to, uh, to, be, to be people who are fit and financially capable by a competent government authority in the country they intend to live with the child. So that's uh, a marathon of uh, what I intended to cover uh, in the in the short presentation I've had. Uh, there is still quite a bit, just like the chair had mentioned, uh, that in terms of provision for uh, foster care and placement uh, rules, we've not had an opportunity to discuss that. We've also not had an opportunity to talk about the child, children who are in conflict with the law. Uh, that will be in, I, I guess, in the next, in the, another presentation. So now I am going to go through some of the comments. Um, see if I can answer if there are any questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, for, for those who've sent their email emails, uh, I think the secretariat will will compile the emails and I can I can send uh, the slides later on. Oh, yeah, someone has asked what is the position in respect to children of tender years since the provision is absent in the new act. I guess the reason why it has been removed is because uh, 
it used to be used to you know give an advantage over, um, men i mean women like mothers over the fathers but again we have to wait and see how the courts will interpret this someone is asking does this mean an mm-hmm. on international adoption my interpretation is since an, an act of parliament has been enacted that's, I don't think it's anything for me to fit myself. Um, I think I've just said everything. I'd, everything I have to say for now. Maybe I may say more later. I don't know. Enforce. Right. Uh, now, does the. But this just. Have... Okay, this uh, someone who's speaking. This, I hope, the... just for avoidance of doubt or. Hello? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, does the court have jurisdiction to revise a parental agreement entered into through mediation? Uh, I believe from practice, uh, there is the review process that you know the courts still have inherent uh, jurisdiction at the end of the day. Yeah? So, and we've seen uh, the provisions under the parental responsibility. Ag- I mean, for the parental responsibility agreements where they can be reviewed or set aside uh, or amended um, adequately, depending on what would be in the best interest. I can see uh, Ms. Lydia Molimu, your hand is up. Uh, Maybe you want to make a comment? Okay, um, she has disappeared. Okay, so any other question, comment? I was given a very short period of time to, to, oh yeah, someone is just asking, does it mean uh, the moratorium on international adoption has ended? I would say yes because um, the moratorium was passed through a cabinet resolution and uh, gazetted, but now we have the same cabinet that now recommended uh, and you know, the president signed into law, uh, the new act. So definitely from uh, my own understanding and reading of the law, I would say that the, moratorium is no longer in force. Uh, okay, with the explicit provisions that PRS be equal, will parental PRS that heavily impose duty on one parent with consent of both parents still be enforceable? Yes, I think they're still enforceable in the same way as consent orders would. Uh, in because you know if for as long as there's parental consent by both parents then you know it that becomes the order which which is the best route to take when a sibling wishes to exercise parental responsibility over a minor sibling where both parents are deceased taking into consideration kinship adoption is now provided for is guardianship a better option uh Guardianship is a faster option, I would say so, but kinship adoption is also an option. And it, now that it's provided, it's more express as opposed to the, the normal process. I would dare say that it's the process is uh, can take a short time, shorter time than it would because we don't, there, there are no requirements for the mandatory bonding period of three months and the matching and placement process. So uh, it really depends on whether the the sibling wants to actually take parental responsibility fully uh, and be actually a parent or just exercise guardianship. So the scope of rights and responsibilities will determine whether um, uh, you're going for a guardianship or you're going for an adoption. Uh, someone is asking uh, about pro bono services for children. How does one apply? 
It is very simple to apply. Just uh, take time, write a letter up and go to the office of the executive officer of the children's court in Nairobi and in Makadara in Milimani and just say that you, you're interested in providing pro bono services for children, you attach your practicing certificate and they will put you in the register and you can you know, help us in doing this work for children. Is the process for applying for kinship adoption similar to the normal, normal one? It is similar, but not the same. The only major difference is uh, for kinship adoption, you do not have a mandatory bonding period, just like uh, just the way it would have been in uh, what I, I call a stranger adoption, as well as pre-selection pre is not, uh, it's allowed for kinship because I mean, it's you already know the person you're adopting and a kinship adoption is faster. You still have to go through the, the adoption society and then from the adoption society straight to court for that process. Um, but again, as I said, this being a new legislation, we, we wait to see how they're going to be, how it will be refined through practice. Okay, uh, I think that's all. Lydia, your hand is still up. Lydia Molimu, Adude. Yes, if you can you hear. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yes, I have a question regarding guardianship. Yeah. And uh, the question is, uh, is a guardian allowed to delegate on their responsibilities towards the child or transfer the guardianship to another person without court intervention? And uh, if that is the case, are there any limitations on whom, on whom they can transfer they can transfer or delegate the guardianship to. Okay, so thank you for that. Let me just go back to the screen I shared. Um, so for, for guardians, um, just a sec, as we saw that under section 124, sub clause two or subsection two, a guardian may further appoint another person to act as a guardian in the event of that guardian's death or incapacity. So uh, if I understood your question, you are asking what are the limitations uh, for, for this kind of appointment? No, I'm not asking where the guardian, uh. where it is predicated on the guardian's death, but during their lifetime and they delegate. So like the guardian is still alive and then delegate to another guardian uh, to now also take up part of the guardianship. I am assuming yeah. that's the question here. Yeah? The other person is a non-guardian. Okay. Uh, the act does not provide for that and uh, because all the guardianship uh, situations as provided for under the act are for either where the parent is dead or the guardian is dead uh, or you know, provides for when they will die, you know, what to happen. But I am certain that you know, the court still has uh, inherent jurisdiction to act in the best interest if it can be shown that at the end of the day, uh, that appointment was made in the best interest of the child for whatever reason, then uh, it should be able to, I mean, it should be upheld. At the end of the day, we're looking for the welfare of the children. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I have answered. What is the best option for spouses who have assumed parental responsibility over non-biological children by virtue of marriage? Is adoption possible? Yes, it is pos possible and actually encouraged, yeah. I think uh, at this point, I'll hand over to LSK um, Nairobi, the secretariat to, I mean, to wrap us up because my time is, is done for this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth.
thank you guys. I still hope to be able to have further conversations and we can meet in different fora and and interact more on, on this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, are you still available to uh, answer a few questions? Yes, yes, I am here. Uh, I'm, tra I'm trying to look through the charts uh, to see some of the questions. Yeah. Uh, one member asked on uh, on uh, uh, asked that uh, at what age can an abandoned abandoned children be declared free for adoption? At what age can an abandoned child be declared free for adoption? That's the question, right? Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, for as long as the child is over six weeks old, because an, a, a, any child who's over six weeks old can be adopted. So, uh, but now the act says that once the child has been found, the, there is a mandatory requirement that the parents and family of this child will be sought after uh, for another, for a period of over a year, yeah. So they've looked for the child is over six weeks old, and the uh, the parents can't be traced, the relatives can't be traced for a period of one year. Then this child can be declared free for adoption. Yes. Uh, there's also a question on whether uh, when acting for a refugee, can they apply to be a guardian? Okay. Thank you. Uh, refugees are not Kenyan citizens, I assume. Uh, the new act prohibits, uh, or rather it's not prohibits, let me use correct terms, limits uh, guardians to only Kenyans. You, it's only a Kenyan who can be a guardian. Uh, no, not a refugee, not a foreigner and all that. Yeah, and uh, some... Yeah, someone is uh, asking me to repeat how to offer pro bono services in Nairobi. All you need to do uh, is to go to the children's court uh, in Milimani, ask, uh, write a letter to the executive of PISA uh, children's court and inform them that you'd like to be put on the register for, for, for pro bono and they will, you know, he, he will put you in so that where there are cases that require children, I mean, children who've been arrested and are being produced in court, you can be called upon to offer representation in that. There was also a question on uh, what the law is doing in cases, in development cases, whereby you find that it's only uh, the the boys that are arrested, that is if uh, uh, both uh, the boy and the girl are minors, it's only the boys who are arrested, yet the girls uh, go scot free. Yeah. The law, uh, legal provision on that. Thank you. So that falls under the provisions of the Sexual Offenses Act. Even before the current, the Children's Act, uh, the practice is uh, to arrest both of them. If you have both minors, both both uh, children are uh, are minors and they engaged in sexual conduct, then they both offended. Both of them they defiled each other, for lack of a better way of putting it. So the cases I have seen in court are where both are arrested, separate cases, but they are, each is a complainant in the other case. Uh, if it's only a, the boy who has been arrested and the girl is not, then that's a, a, a reason to, for concern for uh, now raising issues of discriminatory practices, I would say that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tari. And uh, uh, we are aware that uh, we cannot do, we cannot go through all the provisions of this act uh, in just under two hours. Uh, and uh, I have really learned a lot uh, in a short period of time. 
and I do know that uh, all our participants have learned uh, a lot too. Uh, we are grateful uh, for what you have been able to cover uh, in that short period of time. And uh, we, we, we know that uh, we still uh, have to do uh, more uh, webinars on sensitization. And uh, we, we, we know that uh, when we invite you for the next uh, webinar, you will be available. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as we have indicated before, uh, we will be having uh, another webinar on intersex children on 23rd August 2022 from 2.30 p.m. And our speaker for this uh, webinar will be Senior Counsel John Chikiti. And we invite all our participants to be present during that webinar. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, if you have anything uh, before we close, this is the opportunity. Anything to um, tell our participants? Uh, just one part short, guys. Children are vulnerable. Children are the heritage of our society right now. Let's represent them. Let's advocate for them. Let's, even as council, let's uh, just uh, facilitate uh, cases. You know, if cases that go to court, I've seen very dirty cases in court where children are dragged to the mud and they remain scarred for life. If we can mediate and solve disputes without going to court, let's facilitate that. Let's just act in the best interest of our children. And thank you, everyone, and God bless you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. And uh, we, we will share uh, your presentation once uh, you have shared the same with us. And uh, we have taken note of all the emails that uh, have been sent or have been posted uh, under the chat box. Uh, I now welcome a volunteer to close uh, with a word of prayer. Any volunteer? I can volunteer. Yes, please proceed. Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear God, we thank you so much for today. Thank you for what you've been able to learn. And Father, we pray that you help us, Lord, to be able to put into practice everything that you learned. Thank you for Dr. Elvis. And Lord, we continue to pray that uh, you'll help us to utilize all the resources that we are learning. We thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Miriam. And thank you so much, Dr. Tari. And have a lovely evening. And Amen. all our participants, too, do have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye-bye and thank you. Yeah.